Hey guys, what's up? It's Ripe again. In today's story, an idiotic Karen calls the police on a gardener claiming that he is a trespassing criminal. This absolutely backfires since he is the owner of the community. Here is what happened. Let's dive right into the story. The title story starts like this. I'm a landscaper who gardens for many properties in my high-end gated community in Cape Town, South Africa. Now, I don't garden because I need money, I'm actually the owner of the development company that owns the community. I just do the gardening for fun because I love it. Plus, it's a sneaky way to keep an eye on things. When you are out in the garden, you overhear conversations, catch the gossip and learn who is who in the community. All that can give you a type of experience and insider info that nothing else can. Anyway, it's also entertaining and I'll not deny that. Anyway, coming on to why I'm writing this, one of the homeowners is known as Karen. Now, if you don't know the meaning of that word, Karen is usually used to refer to a woman who is entitled or demanding beyond what is normal or acceptable. This Karen moved into the community about five months ago and from the beginning her presence was hard to ignore just because of how annoying she was and how much she harassed the other residents in such a short time. She would nitpick at little things someone has done and make it into such a big deal as if that person committed the most heinous crimes. She also had a habit of falsely reporting the other homeowners, which led to police officers coming over and disrupting the peace. When asked why she made a report, she would just say that she was looking out for the community. I never actually saw any of this happening because I was only here gardening on Saturdays when Karen would either be out doing whatever or snoring away in her house. Having police come over so often gives the whole place a bad reputation honestly and I know the community members were trying their best to handle it. One such Saturday when I was tending to the garden of someone who has been living here for almost two years now and has become quite a good friend of mine, I saw Karen coming towards me. I already knew that this was gonna be bad news because Karen would never waste her time complimenting or helping others. So I was ready to hear her complain about some plant or some weed or whatever she could nitpick about the garden. Karen, what do you think you're doing? Karen shouted at me which kind of made me surprised because of how loud and shrill her voice was. I still tried to be calm though. Me, I'm doing my weekly gardening here, can I help you with something? Karen, you can help me by getting the F out of here. Okay, wow, that was very weird of her. I wasn't sure why she was saying this, so I tried to clear things up, without hopefully involving police yet again. Me, I don't think you understand. I'm currently working here. Karen, you think I'm effing stupid? I swear, I will never understand why do these people need to curse and shout so much. We can have the same conversation calmly and without the need for such words. Anyway, as tempted as I was to say, yes, I do think you are stupid. I did not want to escalate the situation. Me, I think there's a confusion here. Are you mistaking me for someone else? Karen, stop trying to change the topic. I know what you're doing and if you don't leave right now, I will have the police here throwing you out. I cannot even explain just how shrill and annoying her voice was, it was like broken pieces of a mirror or something. Me, even if you do call the police, nothing will happen because I'm just gardening here. Karen, oh, so you think you can threaten me, huh? I will have you thrown in jail and you will rot there with all the gross people like you. Me, what is your problem? I'm just here gardening. Karen, stop with your excuses. I know you're trespassing here and trying to scope out all the houses so you can come in later and rob us all. Do you think I'm blind to your schemes? I was so damn confused at that moment, like man, what was she even going on about? Me, I do not know what made you think so, but I'm not trespassing. I have the homeowner's permission to be here and garden for him. You can go and ask him. This seemed to make Karen unsure, but it seemed like she didn't want to be proven wrong, so she kept screaming instead. Karen, oh, so should I leave and so you can run away? You are not as sly as you think, you idiot. Now get lost. Me, fine, I'll call the homeowner myself, since you clearly are not smart enough to do that. I was so done with her that after proving my innocence, I was gonna go back home anyway. So I turned around to go bring the homeowner out when I suddenly felt hands on my shoulders shoving me onto the ground. I was somehow able to not fall on my face and stumbled back only for Karen to then pull me and slap me. Me, are you crazy? You think you can just assault me like that? Karen, get out of here or I will do much worse things. Me, like hell you would. So I went to call the police but Karen was faster. Karen, hello police, someone broke into my home, please help me, he is crazy and is threatening to assault me. This freaking piece of jerk human. Thankfully amidst all this chaos and screaming, the homeowner came out and when he saw my state he immediately rushed to my side. Karen saw him and again started with her idiocy. Karen, he is trespassing here, I've called the police. Homeowner, he's not trespassing, he has every 
permission to be here. What made you think he was trespassing? At this, Karen seemed to get scared but still stood her ground, and she had probably realized how majorly she had messed up by now, but didn't want to back away. Karen, you're lying. Both of you are in on it together. This is just a ploy to scope out the area and come back to steal from me later. Police finally arrived before things could escalate further and heard our stories. Karen continued on and on about me being a trespasser and how this homeowner was in on this and blah blah blah. Officer, I'm sorry ma'am, you reported that someone broke in your house but this is an entirely different situation. At that Karen stuttered and explained how she was sure that I would eventually break into her place. The officers looked bewildered and turned to me. I know they had already recognized me as a regular gardener when they have come over for verification or other licenses, but were following protocol so I gave them a rundown of the entire situation as best as I could, even as Karen continued to shout and tried to cut me off. Eventually the officers decided to check our records that made Karen so happy as if it was gonna be proven that I'm some famous criminal who has a track record of doing all of this. Sadly for her, the records only revealed that I was actually the owner of the whole community. Officer, you're the owner of the development company of this community. Why do you garden here? Me, it's just a hobby and to pass some time. Also, to break from the routine. Karen, you're the owner? It was clear that Karen was seriously regretting her actions, but only because she knew who I was and not because she had accepted that she was wrong, which pissed me off even more. Officer, sir, would you be pressing charges? Karen, no, please listen, I was just looking out for the community. You know what? The crime rates are nowadays. No one can ever be too cautious. I decided to completely ignore Karen here and said, yes, I'll be pressing charges. Karen's expression turned pissed and she tried to lunge at me but was caught by the officers who cuffed her and dragged her away. As the legal process unfolded, Karen found herself facing the consequences of her actions. The trial showed her a history of falsely reporting others and revealed the extent of her disruptive behavior in the community. Due to her case of weaponizing emergency services against innocent individuals, she was not given a penalty of three months but in fact six months in prison for her first offense. And here, ripe stars, I really hope that Karen learns her lesson in prison, but I, then again, I doubt it. Either way, the next one is a malicious compliance story. And by the way, if you've watched until here, please don't forget to like the video and maybe even leave a comment because that would help me tremendously. Anyway, about two and a half years ago, my apartment was broken into during a camping trip. Some things were stolen, including multiple firearms. A year and a half ago, one of my firearms was found with some kids selling crack in a small city right over the border of the next state. The plea deal fell through and the girl the cops had initially mentioned was going to trial. I received a letter in the mail telling me of the court data and location, but it's explicitly not a summons. Whatever, I want my gun back sooner than later, so I go. Both the prosecutor and the assistant prosecutor are out sick, one with the virus, and they make us hang around for a while for no reason and eventually I just leave. They didn't like that, but whatever, being there was legally voluntary, I tell them they can mail me the new date and I'll deal with it then. Three weeks go by and here we are this morning, I get home from work and I check my mail. There are two letters, one for the first girl and another for a guy I know just as an accomplice from the updates about the girl. His trial is today and hers is tomorrow, I go to the courthouse 40 minutes away and let them know I am here, everything is fine. They bring in the jury pool and spend two hours getting down to seven jurors, the trial starts and we are just patiently waiting for cops and one other civilian victim slash witness. They tell us, no worries, this will be super quick, they basically just need to ask if it's the firearm I reported stolen and I'll be on my way. They call in the cops who are getting paid this whole time first, it's now 1pm, I've been up for 24 hours on 3 hours of sleep the day before, after working a 12 plus hour overnight shift. My entire body is cramping, I'm super uncomfortable, I'm exhausted and I last ate at 10pm. The assistant district attorney comes out and tells us they are taking an hour lunch break. I tell her I cannot stay and I need to leave. She tells me I'm not allowed to, I already presented as a witness to the judge I'd been summoned, I hadn't, and they can charge me with this or that. One of the cops tells me that they could detain me, the judge could order me, after I point out I haven't been summoned and again, this is voluntary. Basically they try and strong arm me when all I want to do is go home. 
I point out that this guy is not even who I was told was found with my gun. The assistant DA starts explaining how, oh no, he totally was, I don't know who you heard that from. My local PD mentioned a girl by name originally, giving me all these details about the case, then re-emphasizing that I really must stay or I'll be charged with a crime. Don't worry though, we'll get you in right away so you can leave soon, soon being in more than an hour minimum. Here's the thing, the judge issued a sequester order first thing in the morning before jury selection. I say fine and wait, here comes the single greatest act of malicious compliance I've ever committed in my life. So all the attorneys come in, all the jury comes in, the judge makes me swear to tell the truth and I do. As soon as I finish I blurt out the prosecutor, broke the sequester and was telling me about the case during the break. Stop! Everyone except the lawyers out, including me. Eventually they just bring me back in. The judge again makes me swear to tell the truth, confirms I understand what's happening and tells me the importance of a fair trial, maybe don't witness temper then, and explains that witnesses are never to volunteer information and are to only answer the questions. You've been summoned and it's a legal obligation. I let him finish and mention that I've never been summoned. He says, then I'm ordering you, understood? Yes. Everyone comes back in. We all take our oaths again and the prosecutor that was threatening me starts asking questions. Here's the thing, I swore to tell the truth. I never agreed to tell it in a way that makes her life easier. She asks me some basic questions, name, age, what I do for work, etc. And then she gets into the actual questions like, do I own weapons? Did I report any stolen around this date? Did I own one of this model? Did I report this model stolen, etc.? Is this your gun? It certainly looks like it. Did the XXX police contact you when it was recovered? No. Who did? YY Police Department, my local PD. Did they give you any details regarding how it was recovered? They said it was allegedly used in a crime by girl's name. Defense objects and the judge strikes that from testimony. By now the DA is realizing that she's giving me too much leeway and starts asking for yes or no answers. Eventually asks if I would recognize the serial number if I saw it, I tell her no and that roughly sums up my questions from her. Then it's the defendant's turn and it goes exactly as you would expect by now. I answer truthfully but in favorable wording. You said it looks like your gun but you cannot confirm? I'd need to compare the serial number against the police report or the gun shop which still has it on record. Do you know who stole your firearm? No. Do you recognize ZZ? No. She asked a few more plausible deniability questions and then I was free to go. I cannot wait to be back tomorrow for the girl's trial. I will probably be much less malicious but I know the DA will be nervous when she sees me. The court is officially over so the sequester order is no longer in effect, good times and don't worry if I botched her case in this regard that kid had more than enough chances he should have taken the plea deal. And the next one is an am I the a-hole story. So my 35 male sister died 3 weeks ago, my wife had only met her once since she lived quite far away and every time I went to see her my wife did not come. My dad told me that she had died and told me when her funeral was, I traveled down for the funeral and I told my wife that I was gonna see my sister, which was not really a lie. A few days after I got back home, my brother called my wife and told her to check up on me since I hadn't been answering his calls and texts. I guess she asked why he was so worried and my brother told her about my sister dying. My wife got really upset at me for not telling her and she said that I cannot trust her and that I should talk to her instead of bottling up my feelings. I explained that I didn't tell her because I knew she would worry and expect me to talk about how I feel. It's very sweet of her for worrying about me, but she doesn't need to. It's like she doesn't understand that I don't talk about how I feel, unlike her. She has barely spoken to me since and she said that she feels betrayed. I didn't mean to upset her so much, I just didn't want to deal with her constant worrying. Am I the a-hole? And here ripe stars, let me know in the comments what you think about this one. Is OP the a-hole here or not? A first comment said, unfortunately you are the a-hole, first and foremost I'm sorry for your loss. I understand it's hard when a partner can be a little overbearing when they are worried. They love you though, I would be quite hurt my husband would not share something so personal because I would worry, trust that she's there for you. You can say that I don't need you to worry or even I need some time to myself but to purposefully keep information like that from your family, it's just hurtful. I hope you guys can talk it out. Comment number two, sorry dude, you're the a-hole, you cannot hide things from your spouse and this was a big deal. Always be honest with your wife, my recommended approach would have been to tell her what happened and just being clear about what your needs were at the time. You cannot control how worried she feels but there would have been nothing wrong with asking her at the time to support you by trying to make her worrying less obvious. 
Let her know why, for example, perhaps it overwhelms you and stresses you out when she worries excessively. And now let's move on to the next story. It starts like this. I am a type 1 diabetic woman and I've been living with this condition for as long as I can remember. Being type 1 diabetic means that my body doesn't produce insulin, a hormone that regulates the amount of sugar in my blood. Instead, I have to manually inject myself with insulin several times a day or use an insulin pump that is connected to my body. Living with type 1 diabetes has its challenges. For one, I have to carefully monitor my blood sugar levels and I cannot just eat whatever I want without considering how it will infect my insulin levels. If my blood sugar drops too low, I can feel dizzy, shaky and confused. If it goes too high, I can experience fatigue and thirst. Last week I was on a bus going back home. As I settled into my seat I noticed a woman with a young boy sitting a few rows ahead of me. The boy was screaming loudly and the mother didn't seem to be doing anything to quiet him down. I felt myself getting annoyed and frustrated. I had a long day at work and just wanted a peaceful ride home. But this woman seemed completely indifferent to the fact that her son's behavior was inconveniencing others. As the screaming continued I could feel my blood sugar level rising. Stress can affect my insulin levels and I knew I needed to find a way to calm down. I took a deep breath and reminded myself that getting angry would not solve anything. After a few minutes of trying to calm myself down I felt someone watching over me. I opened my eyes and found that a little boy was no longer screaming but instead staring in my direction, specifically staring at my insulin pump that was visible on my waistband. I knew right away that this was gonna be trouble. The boy turned to his mother and pointed in my direction and I could feel my blood pressure rising. I tried to ignore him hoping that he would lose interest but instead he started walking down the aisle towards me, a mischievous glint in his eye. When he reached where I was sitting he made a grab for my insulin pump without even asking me. I was taken aback by his boldness and quickly pulled away. Me is me, Karen the rude woman and Brad, Karen's bratty son. Me? Hey, you cannot touch that, it's very important to me. Karen finally noticed what was happening and quickly intervened. Karen, what's happening here? Me, your son was trying to take my pump and I told him not to. I would appreciate if, surprisingly or maybe not, instead of scolding her son, Karen rolled her eyes at my words and crossed her arms as she looked down at me. Karen, what's the big deal? He just thinks it's an iPod. Can't you let him see it for a minute? I stared at her for a few minutes thinking maybe this was all some kind of sick joke but neither was Karen replying nor was she stopping her son who still kept reaching out towards my pump. Me, I'm sorry I think there's a confusion. This is not an iPod, it's an insulin pump that I need to manage my diabetes. Karen rolled her eyes again and I was starting to feel irritated. Karen, I'm not dumb, I know what it is. But he doesn't and he needs to see it for himself. Well, you look and sound and behave dumb, but what I wanted to say was unfortunately I couldn't because number one, I didn't want to start any drama with this woman and number two, I was not sure that anyone would intervene to help me if this Karen started being violent towards me. Me, I'm sorry but I cannot just hand over my medical device to your son to play with it. Karen, oh come on, it's just a little device, he just wants to play with it for a bit. It. What's the harm in that? Me, first of all, it's connected to my body. Second of all, your son can damage my pump or even drop it, which will cost me a lot. Both in money and my health. Please understand this. Karen, oh please, just say you're a selfish brat who cannot even give a little boy this much happiness. My boy is not freaking disabled like you, he knows how his hands work. Me, well I can tell his hands work by the fact that he had not stopped trying to touch my pump even after I told him no. Being called out like this hurt Karen's feelings and she started glaring at me. Karen, my boy wants to see it and you're being difficult. Give it to him for just a minute, okay? Me, that's not gonna happen. Tell your boy to use his legs now and walk away. Karen, fine, be a little witch. I hope this device stops working before you reach your stupid house. I was taken aback by Karen's words and watched as she walked back to her seat without dragging her son away. The sad son or the biggest brat I'd ever come across continued to make attempts to grab my insulin pump despite my firm no and I started to feel more and more uncomfortable. I tried my best to ignore him but it was getting harder and harder to do so. Then all of a sudden he lunged towards me and grabbed onto my pump. 
I instinctively pushed him away to prevent him from damaging the device or harming me. Karen immediately rushed towards us, yelling and berating me for pushing her son. I tried to explain to her that I was only trying to protect my medical device, but she would not listen. She started to make a scene on the bus, attracting the attention of other passengers. Karen, what do you think you're doing? Don't you dare to touch my boy! Me, your son was trying to grab my medical device. If you cannot control your children, don't have children for Christ's sake. Karen, you think you can do whatever the hell you want because you're disabled, huh? Let's see how you feel when I take this away. And then she ripped the insulin pump off of my body herself. I cried out because it hurt like hell and immediately tried to get it back and this time Karen had the audacity to slap me. I stumbled back into my seat, hyperventilating and fearing for my life as Karen kept screaming. I was almost about to faint when I heard other voices speaking against Karen and some helped me sit straight in my seat. They patted my back and gave me chocolate milk and all the while I could hear Karen arguing with others now. KL for random kind lady on the bus. KL, this is harassment and I'm gonna ask you only once to give this lady her insulin pump back. Karen, and what are you gonna do if I don't hand it back, huh? Are you gonna cry like this brat? Are you gonna beg me too? Karen was getting all up in the kind lady's face and I honestly felt so guilty at putting some stranger in this position until that lady backhanded Karen so hard that she ended up staggered before literally passing out. Her son started crying and screaming while he sat next to her. He even punched a kind lady a few times on her calf but stopped when she glared down. I did notice later on that the kind lady was built like a freaking bodybuilder. The veins on her arms were popping like crazy and you could see the muscles under her fully sleeved dress. No wonder she intimidated the boy easily. KL, are you okay? I was so shocked by the turn of events that it distracted me from the panic attack I was having earlier. The kind lady handed me my insulin pump and asked if I wanted her to call the police. I hesitated a bit but as soon as my stop arrived, police officers escorted Karen and her son out of the bus where I told them I will be pressing charges. They asked for evidence and I told them that the bus had CCTV cameras which they can use. The kind lady also gave the officers her number and offered to be a witness for me. I was honestly so grateful to her for helping me, this case is still ongoing and I'll be meeting the kind lady soon regarding it. I hope I can muster some courage to befriend her, she is so cool and badass. And yeah, ripe stars, I'm very glad that Karen essentially got knocked out in this story because clearly someone had to teach her a lesson. Even better when a kind lady did it. Anyway, if you liked the story, please don't forget to post a comment and maybe even like the video because that would help me tremendously. Thank you so much and the next one is another revenge story. My friend Dan was smart and unconventional. He was a senior electrical engineer at a small company I worked for. This was in the 70s, while talking about cars and car modifications came up, he started explaining the importance of caster and camber in cars and why it's so important to get it right. He then left and told me, did you know the motor vehicle regulations describe the size requirements for a windshield, but you don't actually have to have glass in the frame? He learned this because he built a street legal dune buggy from scratch while in high school and the regulations are crazy complex. Dan was smart, could fix about anything, he started going to community college to get a degree but quit because he knew more than the teacher. As I said, smart and unconventional. Well, the company we worked for was bought by a bigger company and our stock options because a nice windfall. I bought a new car outright and used the rest as a down payment for a house. Others actually cashed their checks, it was a real rush to have that much cash in your hands once in your life. Dan was one of those, he loved cars and he always wanted to test drive a fancy car. And how could they refuse him with a wad of cash big enough to choke a horse? So then he went to the fancy car dealer that had Jaguars, Mercedes-Benz and BMWs. As I said, Dan was unconventional, he was tall and skinny, he had hair down to his shoulders and a bushy beard. He wore jeans, a light colored shirt and a denim jacket. This was before designer jeans became fashionable for men. He was never dirty but frankly he looked like he came down from the top of a mountain looking for a good time. He was nearly always in a good mood and normally had a goofy grin. And then loved cars. He had lots of technical questions about the car, so he showed up and waited for a salesman to approach him and then waited and waited and waited. The place wasn't busy at all, but after 30 minutes he was fed up. He was obviously being purposely ignored. So he gets an idea for petty revenge. He starts yelling, I came here to buy a cash and all of you just ignored me and I was gonna pay cash. 
and he whipped out the huge stack of $100 bills he had spread them out and waved it around for everybody to see. Well, I'm never coming back to this dealership again. I'll buy my car from another dealer. And then he stormed out. He laughed so much when he told us this story, I bet it felt great. And with this, we have reached the end of the video. However, if you cannot get enough of my content, please check out my endless playlist where you can find thousands of hours of content. In addition, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel to not miss any of my daily uploads. Thank you so much in advance and I hope to see you again tomorrow.